Theodosius could refuse to recognize Maximus, but he couldn't yet march into Gaul and displace him. Maximus could hold the western provinces, but he couldn't yet push his way into Italy without a heavy fight. Valentinian could hold the peninsula, but he couldn't do much more beyond that. So, a stalemate set in. Sure, in the spring of 384, Theodosius marched a force toward Illyria, but that was mostly a PR stunt to show that he was doing something about the problem of Maximus. Clearly, though, he never had any intention of crossing the mountains. But that didn't mean that Theodosius was actually doing nothing. In fact, as the emperor headed west for his not very serious photo op, an embassy was headed east on a very serious mission to convince the Sassanids to remain peaceful so Theodosius could turn his full attention to Maximus without worrying about his rear. The leader of this embassy? A senior staff officer of Vandal origin who we will all shortly come to know and love. Stilicho. Meanwhile, back in Italy, Valentinian II's generals were similarly engaged in PR stunts backed by serious behind-the-scenes diplomacy. The Milan court decided that some Alamanni near the border with Raetia posed too great a threat to the empire to be ignored, and so an army was sent into the mountainous province to conduct exercises and make sure the Germans didn't get any funny ideas. But up in Trier... Maximus took those exercises for what he believed they were, which was a show of force directed at him, and he sent envoys down to Milan protesting that these troops were coming dangerously close to violating what he now considered to be his airspace. To which Valentinian's report replied, Hey, those Germans threatened both of us, so quit being so paranoid. This back and forth wound up opening the door for a normalization of relations. Valentinian in the end agreed to stay out of Gaul, Britain, and Spain, while Maximus agreed to leave Italy alone for now, and they both agreed to keep an old barbarian enemies. It is tough to say through all of this what degree of recognition Maximus managed to win for himself, but from here on out, he does seem to have moved beyond unrecognized usurper and into a more official Augustus status. But whether this was de facto or de jour, or whether or not Theodosius recognized it, remains, at least to me, an open question. Whichever it was, the three sides made no aggressive moves over the next four years, and everyone seemed temporarily satisfied with the power-sharing agreement. But that did not mean that they stopped trying to position themselves for an inevitable showdown. One of the key flanks everyone was trying to shore up was the religious flank, with Ambrose of Milan once again right smack dab in the middle of everything. At first, it seems a little weird that the emperors would choose this of all moments to begin taking extreme religious positions that undermine social stability, but when viewed in the larger political context, it does begin to make some sense. Both Maximus and Theodosius knew that Ambrose was a huge power broker in Milan, so much of a power broker that he could be seen as something of a kingmaker. With the bishop's support, Maximus might just be able to carry off the West. With the bishop's support, Theodosius might just be able to intertwine the Valentinian and Theodosian families to the point that they became indistinguishable, which meant that Theodosius' sons would be in line to inherit the empire. So, playing to an audience of one, Maximus and Theodosius began to go back and forth in a game of who could be the stronger, more radical defender of the Nicene Creed. Of course, in virtue of having been in power for five years already, Theodosius had a head start. I didn't want to get sidetracked into this when discussing the Gothic War, but in the middle of the conflict, Theodosius decided to stake out a position in the Great Christian War between the Arians and the Nicaeans. By this point in history, the battle lines between the two sides had been drawn, very roughly drawn, between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East. In the West, a Nicaean majority lorded over an Arian minority 
while in the East, these roles were reversed. This meant that when he came to power, Theodosius, born in Spain and a devout Nicene, found himself ruling over the half of the empire that believed the opposite of what he believed. So what did he do? Did he keep religion from becoming a divisive issue by downplaying the doctrinal differences between himself and his subjects? Well, you'd think so, but instead he did the other thing. In early 380, with the Gothic War raging all around him, Theodosius became sick. So sick that he feared for his life and requested a formal baptism. Following this baptism, the emperor suddenly recovered, and it was hard not to draw a connection between the two events. Fueled by a religious certainty that now bordered on fanaticism, when Theodosius entered Constantinople for the first time later in the year, one of the first things he did was depose the Arian bishop of the capital city. He then promulgated a famous edict, stating flatly that the emperor considered Nicene Christianity to be the only form of Christianity. Everything else would be considered false and heretical and be against the law. Through the end of the war with the Goths and into the period of stalemate with Maximus, Theodosius endorsed and then backed a systematic program to remove Arian clergymen from church offices and replace them with Nicaeans. This, as you can imagine, did not go over too well with the locals, but for the time being, there was very little they could do. It was one thing to fight the Nicaeans when they were just a collection of rival priests. It was quite another to fight them when they were backed by imperial agents who had, you know, like swords and stuff. Oddly enough, though, Theodosius' religious zeal did not yet extend to paganism, which he treated with a fair degree of tolerance throughout this period. Blood sacrifices were out of the question, of course, but other than that, the remaining pagans in the East did not have to deal with the same kind of treatment doled out by Gratian in the West. And that tolerance would eventually be dropped by Theodosius as a part of his general Make Nice with Ambrose program, following the unpleasantries at Thessalonica in 390. But for now, Theodosius generally left pagans alone. When Maximus came to power in 383 then, he could see that he had some catching up to do if he was going to be perceived by Ambrose as the true great defender of the Nicene Creed. Now, the main reason it was so important to be seen as a staunch Nicene was because at that moment, the powerful Ambrose was technically backing an Arian court. The Empress Justina was an Arian, and as a result, her young son Valentinian was too. As we'll see in a second, this led to all kinds of nasty little disputes between the imperial family and the bishop. And because the majority of the population in Milan was Nicene, this meant that it would be pretty easy for Ambrose to use these disputes to drive a huge wedge between the imperial family and the citizens of Milan, if he were so inclined. Maximus figured that if he could prove his Nicene bona fides, Eventually, Ambrose might get sick of supporting those damned heretics in the imperial palace and throw his weight behind the Nicene usurper up in Trier. In an effort to win over Ambrose's support, Maximus decided to do Theodosius' Nicene extremism one better. But there weren't really any Arian clergy he could expel from office, since his provinces didn't really have too many Arian clergymen. But there were heretical communities out there just waiting to be persecuted. There was really only one method of persecution left. Sometime between 384 and 386, a bishop from the Iberian Peninsula named Priscillian wound up in a heated theological fight with the mainstream Nicene surrounding him. After most of his allies in the church were deposed, Priscillian wound up appealing directly to Maximus for aid. To the great surprise of the heretical bishop, Maximus decided to hear the appeal, and then deny the appeal, and then hand down a little divine justice. Priscillian and six of his followers were arrested and then beheaded. 
It was the first recorded case of an execution on charges of heresy in history, though technically I think he was brought up on charges of practicing magic. And it was also the first recorded case of the state handing down a death sentence to resolve a church dispute. But though it earned him an ignoble place in history, the move kind of backfired on Maximus, as Ambrose harshly condemned the executions. Because it was wrong to kill over doctrinal disputes? Well, no. Ambrose opposed the executions on the grounds that Maximus had strayed out of his jurisdiction. Church matters should be solved by the church. Maximus had no right to interfere. The business with Priscillian just so happened to occur right after Ambrose's second trip to Trier in 385, when he went to see about retrieving Gratian's body so that it could be properly buried. But this time around, Ambrose had been met by a slightly more hostile version of Maximus. Yes, he was courting the Nicaeans generally, and yes, he badly wanted Ambrose's support specifically. But that did not stop the general from taking the opportunity to angrily come down on Ambrose for bargaining in bad faith the last time around. Convinced that the bishop's stalling had cost him his best chance at total victory, Maximus refused to release Gratian's body, and Ambrose wound up heading home empty-handed. It is entirely possible that fallout from this summit was behind Ambrose's later condemnation of the execution of Priscillian, though Ambrose did not really need an ulterior motive to argue that emperors had no business messing with church affairs. His belief in that principle is well-documented. Part of that well-documentation came shortly thereafter in 386, and is the famous incident at the Portion Basilica. During his years as bishop, Ambrose so completely put his Nicene stamp on Milan that by the mid-380s, the Arian minority in the city, including the Empress Justina and the Emperor Valentinian II, literally had no place to worship. Ambrose allowed not a single church in the city to preach anything resembling that heretical Arian nonsense. This, of course, greatly annoyed the Empress, and so in 386 she asked for a small measure of consideration. She asked Ambrose to give the Arians one church in the city center and one church out in the suburbs so that her and her doctrinal brethren could worship in peace. Ambrose, of course, flatly refused. So what if the request was coming directly from the emperor? Arianism was heresy and wasn't going to get a platform so long as Ambrose was bishop of Milan. So then a Praetorian prefect came round to talk sensibly with Ambrose and said, look, maybe just give her the one in the suburbs, the so-called Portion Basilica. That would be all right, wouldn't it? But again, Ambrose refused. This annoyed the empress so much that she had Valentinian order a contingent of house guards down to the basilica in question to just take it by force. These guards entered the church and began hanging up Arian decorations in preparation for an Arian Easter service when word got out of what was happening. Pretty soon, Ambrose's Nicene congregation showed up at the scene and began violently agitating against the occupation of the church. Then, a small group of them pushed their way in, pushed out the guards, and blockaded the door. So now, we have a full-blown situation. Ambrose himself stayed away from the scene, but made it known that he fully supported the expulsion of the Arians, 